Hello, everybody. It is Thursday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Joined, as always, for our weekly Zeiss is Right video by Paul Zeiss, Post-Gazette Sports Columnist. Paul, this is our last show of the uh, the 2023. We're going to do our Steelers post-game show on New Year's Eve, but this is our last regular Thursday. Uh, how do you feel getting to the end of 52 weeks of, of dealing with me? Well, I mean, that, that, it's been a it's been a, a fun ride, and uh, you know we've had a lot of ups and downs in terms of what we've been talking about and the different uh, things going on with sports. Um, so uh, the fact that we're still talking about the football season means that uh, we are one of I think twenty four markets that still have NFL teams alive, which is exactly what the NFL wants, and it's how it's designed, is that we're in week 17, and 24 teams still have a chance to make the playoffs. Yeah, and you know what? That's that's, that's good for the news business because we at least have something to talk about. Um, the, the topic is going to be the quarterbacks. I don't know if there's a whole lot else to talk about with the Steelers this week. It's just Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, and just the various angles that we're going to analyze that uh, choice through. We're going to talk about uh, today in, in terms of 2024 and, and whether the Steelers should consider next season in making choices about these last two games as they look to make the playoffs. Before we do, just want to thank our primary sponsor for this episode of the podcast, Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Paul, there is a contingent of people who argue that Kenny Pickett should – not be getting the start necessarily on the merits alone, but because the Steelers need to know, quote unquote, what they have in him going into 2024. R. Ray Fittipaldo in his chat, you know, rejected that argument wholeheartedly. He thinks the Steelers only really care about winning A and, and what gives them the best chance to win these next two games to give themselves a chance to get into the playoffs if they get some help. Um, and, and B, you know, that, that, are two games really going to sh- change our, per- our perspective on Kenny Pickett and the season that, that he's had last season? I think it did to, to some extent, the way he closed against the Raiders, the Ravens, some of the throws he made in that game, you know, we talked about them for six months. Um, so, you know, knowing that that's what happened last year and, you know, knowing what you've seen from Kenny Pickett this year, could he change your perception of him if he was healthy enough to play these last two games? I mean, I, I suppose he could, but, Ray is absolutely 100% right. None of that matters. Here's what matters. The Steelers find a way to beat the Seahawks and Ravens. And whatever that takes is all that matters. The big picture doesn't matter. The long term doesn't matter. Next year doesn't matter. Kenny's confidence doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is who gives us the best chance to win this week and then who gives us the best chance to win next week. More importantly, for the crowd that thinks that somehow there's going to be some sort of development that is going to be missed out on if he doesn't play these two games at the end of the year for the reps and everything else, he's playing in an offensive system that is not going to be the offensive system next year. He's playing in an offensive system that's not going to be any, probably even anywhere remotely close to what they look at next year. With play callers who probably aren't going to be around next year unless they go back to their nor- you know, their original uh, jobs, it's irrelevant. Him playing in this system for two more games, I would argue, is actually probably a bad thing. You know, I think probably the best thing it can for Kenny Pickett is that he doesn't have to play in this system anymore, and then he can clear his mind and get you know get started with a new system next year with an offensive coordinator and offensive design that knows. You know, an offensive coordinator that knows how to design an offense that makes sense. So to me, I, I just think it's it's one of those talking points that doesn't make sense. There's nothing at all to be gained by Kenny Pickett playing two games in this offense with this offensive coordinator or combination or whatever it is. It's 100% got to be what gives the Steelers – the best chance to win. And once you figure that out, then you go from there. And if the answer is Kenny Pickett at the end of the day, I'm okay with that. 
But that can be the only reason why you play with him. You know, you you put him in the game. He gets healthy. Let's say he's got two or three games. Two, two, two. It'll really be two days. You know, today and tomorrow. If he can't run around today and tomorrow, it'll be over. You know, by tomorrow afternoon, we'll know whether or not he's playing or not. But my point is, if he if 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 he shows that he's healthy and he can move again and he can run around and protect himself on his leg and make all the throws. If Mike Tomlin, you know, announces via, you know, statement or whatever on Friday that, hey, Kenny Pickett's going to start for us tomorrow, I can live with that because he's the starter. And, you know, through a lot of evaluation of that they did, they evaluated him as their best quarterback. Now, obviously, Mason Rudolph is coming off a really good game. You know, there's the, the other theory is just go with the hot hand, and I, 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 can, I can live with that too. It's, it's one of those – discussions adam that for the you know there's a few times like this where i don't really have a really strong opinion one way or the other about which guy should start assuming kenny pickett is healthy now if he's 80 percent or even 85 percent then it's idiot then it's idiotic to start him but the reason has to be we think he gives us the best chance to win if mike Tomlin says Kenny Pickett is healthy. He's our starter. We believe he gives us the best chance to win. I can live with that. If it's anything other than that, I can't live with it. And and, and this nonsense about how well these two games are going to be crucial to his development. No, actually, I would argue that playing two more games in this system might actually hurt his development. So that's where I'm at. I, I If you play Mason Rudolph, okay, he's the hot hand. I can go with that. If you play Kenny Pickett and he's healthy, I could go with, well, you know, they did win seven games with him as their starter. I can live with that too. Paul, let me ask the question this way. Let's let's say they go through the evaluation. They say Kenny Pickett is is our guy. He's he gives us the best chance to win. That's that's the choice. What letter grade do you give Penny, Kenny Pickett for this season? And how much could he change that opinion? You know, what's the what's the plus minus on his letter letter grade? Is it a half, you know? Is it a plus or minus? Is is it is it a whole letter grade? Um, how much could he change it if he he came out and, and played well? They win the last two games, whether or not they make the playoffs, uh, they give themselves a chance, you know, to be in the mix. But what's your what's your view on, I, on how much he could change the perception? I give him a C. I don't think he's been great. I don't think he's been horrific. I think he's had moments where he's been pretty good. I think he's had moments where he's been pretty bad. I give him a C. If he comes out and plays two really good games and they win, and he's a big part of why they won, maybe I move him to a B minus, right? But far too many of these games, they've won just basically almost despite him and not because of him. You know, uh, the one thing you can say about Mason Rudolph is he was a huge part of why they won the other game, won the game the other day. You know, made good throws made big plays. They scored 34 points, and really only only uh, one of the touchdowns was on a short field. And I would argue this, uh, even, you know, that touchdown, they didn't, they haven't always got that, you know? Like, like they've gotten short fields and ended up having to settle for field goals. So, you know, the fact that they punched it in is, 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 is a good development as well. So, to me, I, I mean, if you look at the number of games this year where you can say they won really in large part because of Kenny Pickett. I don't know that there's any, I mean, I think, you know, he, he, he's had a hand in that. Right. But I don't know that there, that does he have a game like, like last week where Mason Rudolph, where they put up 34 points where they're up 21, nothing before the other team even could breathe. I, I, I just don't know that. I, it, and here, here was one of the most telling things I'll tell you. Do you think if Kenny Pickett was playing quarterback, with a minute 50 left or a minute 40 left and it's, you know, 21, nothing or whatever. Yeah, it was 21. Was it 21, nothing? What was the score at halftime of that game? It was 24, nothing at halftime. Yeah. Right. So when it was 21, nothing, do you think Kenny Pickett, they would have allowed Kenny Pickett to throw the key, you know, even when it got to be, they got a holding call. It was third and 20. They were backed up and they, you know, Mason Rudolph is firing away and he's throwing the ball. He threw that ball down the sideline to Pickens that set up a field goal. You think they would have allowed Kenny Pickett to do that? Because I don't. I think they would have handed it off a few times and punted and got out of there. 
you know, hey, we're up 21 nothing. Let's just not make a mistake. So I'm just saying I would have to see a lot from Kenny Pickett in two games before I would take him from like a solid C to a B minus. Paul, um, I want to ask you about Mason Rudolph in, in a second, but we've got one more question, you know, kind of regarding this, this notion of uh, do these last two games really matter? There's definitely a contingent as well that I think wants to see the Steelers lose these two games. Um, and, and in some, I think, misguided belief that it's going to change the Mike Tomlin situation. In some, I think, misguided belief that you're going to get a significantly better draft pick. Um, what do you say to, to people who say, it'd be, it, you know, ideally that the Steelers lose these next two games because it's better for their long-term future. Um, do you, do you see that? Cause uh, to me, listen, I'm 33 years old. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not too old, but I, I don't think you wish away playoff berths either. And, and I think when they're in the mix um, that it's, it's kind of crazy for people to just be talking about the potential of making the playoffs. Like it's nothing. Well, I would have said this, if they'd have lost to the Bengals, then yeah. Then, yeah, if they'd have lost to the Bengals, I'd say, yeah, probably you just want to lose two games and try and get a better draft choice. But you're in the playoff hunt. You're in the playoff hunt. You got to get, you got to go for it. You got to want to go for it. You got to want to get there. Um, I don't believe in the idea that, oh, well, if you get there, I mean, anything can happen. I don't think this team could make a run by the same token. Okay. Let's just like go down fantasy land for a little bit here, Adam. What if Mason Rudolph truly has found something and he can give them a reasonably good passing game like he did? Not quite as good as he did the other day, but gives them an actual reasonably good passing game, right? Let's say their defense, although losing a Landon Roberts, that's a tough loss as well. But let's say their defense is able to continue to have make big plays and do the things they're going to do, right? Who in the AFC is that good that you couldn't say, I mean, right as it, as it were to stand, if they were to make the play, say they were to sneak into the playoffs, okay? The number two seed is probably going to be the Dolphins. You mean to tell me that the Steelers couldn't beat the Dolphins? I, I mean, I'm not saying they would, but that wouldn't be a mind. That wouldn't be like when they upset uh, Peyton Manning and the Colts. But you know what I mean? It, it wouldn't be yeah. like this monumental upset. You know, even the Ravens, they already beat the Ravens. And I know the Ravens are, you know, really good. But my point is, so you got to, you got to say, give them a chance, get in the playoffs, see what happens. I mean, they might go in the playoffs and get, you know, get pounded, but who cares? You'd rather do that. They might win a game. Everyone sits here and we, I like, we got to listen to the, like the uh, Mike Tomlin hasn't won a playoff game in how many number of years. Well, listen, there were a lot of years where like he wasn't going to win a playoff game when Ben Roethlisberger's arm got shredded. He wasn't going to win probably a playoff game with, with Kenny Pickett as a rookie last year. He probably wasn't going to win a playoff game with, with Ben Roethlisberger on his last legs. So, you know, I don't necessarily hold the, the playoff win thing against him as much as I think other people do. Um, but you know, if you're going to make that argument that he hasn't won a playoff game, you can't then say, well, ideally they'll just punt on this year too, because I do think it's a pretty wide open AFC. And, uh, and if you won a playoff game, I think that changes the tone of this. It means you finished 10 and seven, won a playoff game. And, and I think that was the bar for everyone going into the season. Was it not? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, you, you, that's what you would like to see, obviously. Um, by the same token, if they go nine and eight, miss the playoffs. And I do think that you, it starts to become significant that it's now been seven years since, you know, since they've won a playoff game. That's pretty significant in the Steelers, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of the Steelers. Uh, and I would make the same argument, listen, about John Harbaugh. I think it's hilarious. You know, John Harbaugh, the other night I'm watching that game and they're going on and on and on about what an incredible coach he is and this and that. And what he's done has been incredible with the with the Ravens. And I'm like, He's won one playoff game in nine years. So I'm not saying that he's not a good coach, but could, you know, at some point we have a really strange, I don't know, subculture of people who don't seem to understand that winning in the postseason really, really matters a lot more than winning in the regular season. I don't know what it is about it. You know what I mean? We, we had that for years and years and years with the Jamie Dixon crowd. You know, we'd rather win 30 games and lose in the second round than win 25 games and get to the final four. I mean, there's this mentality that, so I'm not saying the regular season doesn't matter, 
But if we're going to talk about John Harbaugh, it's like, I mean, where do the greatest coaches of the and the legends of these coaches, where are they? Where is it actually established? It's in the playoffs. It's in the postseason. It's in the biggest games against the best teams. That's why, you know, when you look at it, Bill Cowher chased it for 15 years or 16 years before whatever it was, before he finally won a, a Super Bowl. But he also had a couple of, you know, runs the AFC title game and he had postseason success. So when he actually retired, you know, he's got a winning record in the playoffs. You know, Andy Reid, okay, he didn't win a Super Bowl every single year, but he's had a lot of success in the play, in the postseason. Those are the biggest games against the best teams, and I think that's why sometimes it, it's frustrating to me that we lose track of that, that, you know, all of these regular season records and accolades are great, but show me coaches that are considered legendary that didn't have post that, you know, that didn't have postseason success and more than just one time. That's the, that's the thing about it. So, I mean, I, I think it is, there's a balance here. You know, they go 10 and seven and win a playoff game. To me, I think, honestly, if they go 10 and seven and win a playoff game, Mike Tomlin, it's one of his best jobs ever in many ways, you know, uh, given all the injuries they've had, given the issues they've had at quarterback, given the, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Adversity with respect to the offensive coordinator. I mean, there's a lot of things you can say. Wow. You know, I still don't think he'd be coach of the year, though. Coach of the year to me is Kevin Stefanski, given all of the players they've lost and the fact that they've had four different quarterbacks and the fact that if, yeah, they, beat, if, they, if they beat the Jets this week, is that who they play? If they mm -hmm. beat the Jets this week, um, they're going to be they're going to have 11 wins. That's that's incredible to me. Oh, and they're good. I mean, they're a good team, Paul. I sat down and watched a good chunk of that game against the Texans the other day, and it's, it's not just that they're pulling games out miraculously like the Steelers tend to do. They were good. I mean, right. Mari Cooper, what was it, 265 yards? Joe Flacco was just tearing them up. I mean, that's they weren't just, you know, just getting by. They were tearing them up. Right. So, um, right. you know, that, that's something I think you have to put in Stefanski's um, hat as well. Paul, I want to ask this about Mason Rudolph. If we're going to talk about 2024 in terms of, of Kenny Pickett and what that would mean for him, um, what, what would it mean for Mason Rudolph to, to play well in these last two games, um, you know, show out some at some level? I think the Steelers are still invested in Kenny Pickett. I think maybe you'd have something of a competition, but I think Penny, Kenny Pickett would still be the favorite there. But could you imagine Mason Rudolph being the number two for this team, not just next season, but maybe for the foreseeable future if, if he shows – He's capable in these last two games if, if that's what he ends up playing? Perhaps, but I think it's probably more realistic that he'll go somewhere else, that he'll be somewhere else next year. Um, now, I could see him becoming like that Charlie Batch kind of player that, you know, is a long-term backup, uh, that's a reliable guy that goes in and plays, you know, three or four games every year because of various things. Um but I'd be shocked if they bring him back. I feel like the, I feel like he, you know he's probably at the end of his road here. Um, you know, now if he goes and he plays really well, and they go in the off season and they say, "Listen, we're going to give you a legitimate chance to start," he might think about it, right? But I think he's going to try and look for a place where he can go play. That's the biggest thing with him is I think he wants to play a lot. He wants to get back to playing, and and the only way you can get back to playing is by basically um, going somewhere else. Because I, I, I don't care what anybody says, Kenny Pickett is going to be the guy next year. He's going to be the starter, and everybody knows that. So if you're Mason Rudolph and you decide, you know, they offer you a contract and you decide, listen, I'm going to bet on myself, from the standpoint of I don't think that Kenny Pickett is that good, I guess. But I have a feeling he's going to be going elsewhere. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Paul, um, I'm going to quickly read off the other team's schedules the rest of the way. Um, our Ray Fittipaldo, you know, kind of outlined what the Steelers need. And they need to win the last two games. And they need two of the four teams we're about to talk about to lose one game. And that's the clearest path to the playoffs. So let me ask, let me, let me just go through each of these teams, Paul, and tell me where you think we might see these losses. I'm going to start with Buffalo. They have Miami and New England left. Um, do you see a loss for the Bills out of those two games? Uh, I think the Miami game is in Buffalo, isn't it? Uh, I think so, yeah. 
I think it's in Buffalo. No, I, I think Buffalo is going to win both of those games. Uh, no, actually, it's in Miami. Actually, I could see a loss there. Yeah, at Miami. That that's a weird series. Those two teams when they play each other, um, it's one of those one of those things where when they play each other, um, the, the home team usually wins. So yeah, I could see a loss there for sure. Okay. Uh, let's go to the Texans. They have Tennessee and Indy. So I guess, I mean, there's going to be one loss between those two teams. Um, so, what, you know, either the Texans or Colts are going to beat each other. So there's one. Uh, do, you, do you think, you know, it's possible that um, the Texans could lose to Tennessee? You know, we've seen them. We've seen the, t- the Titans put some scares into people. I think Will Levis is still hurt, though, right? Yeah, is Stroud hurt or is he back? That's the question. Yeah, that's a good. That, I, I'm not sure either whether it, his yeah, it, is 100% that, that, that would be the thing I would say if he's back. You know, it, it, I could, but I could see the Texans losing that game. I could actually see the Texans losing both of their games. <clears throat> so, then, I, I, yeah, I, they'd I, be kind of, I kind of feel like the Colts are going to win twice. Right, they'll, they'll, I, I feel like the Colts are going to beat. Who do they play this week? They'll, yeah, the, Col- the Colts next have uh, the Raiders and Texans, and both at home. I, I like the I like them to win both of those games, so that would put them at ten and seven. Uh, the Bills, obviously, I could see them losing to Miami. That would put them at ten and seven. Uh, the Texans, I think, are going to be gone. The Bengals are gone. So then it becomes the Steelers. The question is, can the Steelers win two games? That would be the question. Here, here's how. Here's what I kind of find. Here's what I kind of see happening. I feel like the Steelers will lose once, unless unless Paul Baltimore wins this week and sits starters. I mean, I think right. that you I know, could, I could see that, but I could also see a scenario where Baltimore. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I I just I feel like the Steelers are going to lose once. Um, whether it's this week or next week, I don't know which one. But my prediction is this. It'll be uh, Ravens, Dolphins, Chiefs. uh, I I believe Jacksonville will win that division. Uh, And then I think that um, the Browns and then the Bills and the Colts will be the three three, uh, wild cards. That's my prediction. Yeah, I can see that. And... and you know, that's why you don't lose to those, you know, two lost teams is, is so you avoid these situations. I, yeah, I think the, the Steelers are going to get the help that they need. I think the bigger question is whether they win those two games. Um, Paul, I want to talk a little bit about the Peach Bowl, Penn State in the Peach Bowl and bowl season in general with you uh, to wrap up the show. Before we do, just want to thank a couple more sponsors. Goldberg, Persky, and White. If you were diagnosed with mesothelioma or lung cancer, call your local attorneys at Goldberg, Persky, and White. For over 40 years, their firm has represented thousands of lung cancer and mesothelioma victims. Call 1-800-COMPLEX or visit gpwlaw.com for a free consultation. Also want to thank Propel Schools. Propel's 13 public charter schools in Allegheny County build a solid academic foundation for lifelong learning and offer more personalized instruction at every level during your child's kindergarten through 12th grade education journey. Give your children the quality education they deserve. Learn more and apply to Propel Schools by visiting propelschools.org. Um, Paul, I, I know that the bowl season has lost some of it, its luster. We're going to talk about opt-outs specifically in the Orange Bowl in a second. But listen, you got Penn State, James Franklin against Lane Kiffin, two guys who I think are both dogged by not winning the big game, facing each other in a big game. Who do you think of those two needs this game more with the understanding that you know bowl season doesn't quite mean what it used to? Uh, wow, that is a great question. I, I would actually say um, probably, wow, I would probably say Lane Kiffin. I mean, I think that, you know, he's had, they're having a great year for Ole Miss. And, and you, you know, kind of legitimize it by winning, a, you know, a New Year's Six Bowl against uh, Penn State. You know, I, and I think, you know, the, at the end of the day, James Franklin, um, his program's established. I don't think that anybody, you know, questions that. I think that he's recruited well and all that other stuff. The brand of Penn State is intact. You know what I mean? So it all adds up to me to the to say that basically I think that Ole Miss and what Lane Kiffin is trying to build at Ole Miss 
probably could use the uh, the, the the you know the, the the jolt of energy or whatever from winning a big game like the Peach Bowl. Yeah, I tend to agree, Paul. Um, the only thing I'd say is, you know, all the people who were furious with James Franklin after those losses to Michigan and Ohio State this year, and, and rightfully so, you're just going to add fuel to the fire if you don't get, you know, kind of a signature win. You beat Iowa, but I don't know, Iowa and the way they play offense, you know, it, do, it doesn't seem to matter how many games Iowa wins. People think of them as a national joke. Um, and, and to ha have that as your signature win going into, you know, next season with so much change, you know, I think would add a lot of pressure you know, as opposed to getting this win, ha having something to hang your hat on, just kind of like last season. How much did the Rose Bowl change our perception of Penn State? Um, you know, if they go in there and lose to Utah, you know, do we have the same expectations that we had for them? I don't know. So um, I think it's important for Penn State to, to get a win. But I would agree with you that it's probably more important for Lane Kiffin, um, especially because, you know, Ole Miss is not as, as established as a program and not necessarily a part of the power structure the way Penn State is. It's trying to get there, but it's not there quite yet. Um, right. Paul, I, I also wanted to ask, for Penn State, you know, kind of getting back into how important this game could be, listen, it's it, they got opt-outs. Olu Fashnu is not going to be there. Um, going to be there. This is not the team that we've seen all season. But you still have Drew Aller. You still have Nick Singleton. You still have Katron Allen. Those guys are the backbone of your team going into next season. You know, how important is it for them to, to kind of go out on a good note kind of like they did in that Michigan State game. They made some big plays, um, you know, down the field, you know, in the passing game and the running game. Don't, you know, against a defense that's not quite Big Ten quality and will miss, don't you want to see some of that from those guys and, and keeping that momentum going, you know, going into 2024? Well, I know I, I anger bull, uh, I anger college football fans that, you know, still love the bowl system when I say bowl games are essentially the first spring game. Because that's really what they are. I mean, if, if you think about it, in a lot of cases, that's what they are. So I always think there's value for these younger guys to get to go out there to play, uh, to kind of just sort of build on what they were trying to do at the end of the season, continue to show that they're, they're making progress. They're going to get live reps, you know, a week, a full week of practice and then live reps. Um, yeah, I think it's important. I think it's important for them to go out and, and, and also show that, uh, what we saw uh, the last week or two was not a fluke and sort of get themselves in, 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 in ready for, okay, now you go into spring football in a couple of weeks and you start, you know, building on what you did at, at the end of this year and also uh, through December. It's absolutely important. I think it's also important because, you know, you want to get yourself positioned probably in the rankings and things of the such. You probably want to be higher in the rankings because we've seen if you start higher in the rankings, it's easier to finish higher in the rankings. So, uh, and based on how they finish up this year, I, I bet you that would be uh, that that will go into play. That will come into play uh, in the preseason rankings next year. So, there's a lot of things I think that Penn State, you know, we can find out about Penn State. Uh, but I think some of these younger players that are basically going to be the the the, the foundation of the team next year. Uh, this is, you know, this is a pretty big game for them. Paul, the Vegas line last I saw was minus four for Penn State. Um, does that sound right to you? And, and you know, who are you picking on that line? I think uh, even with a, even with a couple of defections or opt outs or whatever we call them, I, I think Penn State's defense is the best unit of the, on the field of the four. So I think that defense is going to prove to be a real problem for for Ole Miss. Uh, so I like Penn State minus – I like Penn State. I'll take Penn State minus the points. I, I actually think Penn State might win by 10 or more. Um, I just feel like I, – I think I think Ole Miss's defense is going to – or offense is really going to struggle, I think, against uh, Penn State's defense, even with a couple of guys opting out. Yeah, I tend to agree with you, Paul. I, I think it's, you know, like you said, that's the best unit of, of the four. I, I think they're going to stymie old Miss just enough. They might give up some points. They might give up 20 points, 25 points. But I don't know if their defense is necessarily good enough to, to slow down Penn State and their playmakers. I think Penn State's big problem has been running into defenses like its own, right, in Ohio State and Michigan and, and not being able to keep up with them offensively. I think this is a team they can keep up with offensively. And, and that's why I think I, I'm going to pick Penn State in this game. Um, Paul, I'll get you out of here on this. 
what do you think of this Orange Bowl situation with all these opt-outs? And, and can next season get here soon enough? Because I think this is, you know, the, the solution to a lot. Like the big bowl games, other than the playoffs, don't seem to matter as much to players anymore. Well, now you put every single one of the New Year's Six Bowls in the playoff. They're all going to be important for, to, for determining a national champion. Um, is that the fix that the big bowl games needed? And, and can you wait to, to not have to deal with, you know, what's going on at the Orange Bowl? I used to be um, staunchly against more teams in the playoffs. I used to be a guy that said six is enough, maybe eight at the most. I'm to the point now where 16 is the number. They should go from 12 to 16. Have, you know, 16, that gives you uh, right, right off the bat, eight of these bowl games become, you know, uh, playoff games or quarterfinals or whatever we call them, right? Actually, uh, would it be quarterfinals? 16, yeah, or whatever whatever it would be. But you'd have eight games there. Then you could, you know, the winners of those, you're down to uh, uh, eight teams. So that's four more. That's 12 bowls there. And then two semifinals. So, you know, you're talking about basically 14 games. Of 14 of these bowl games, you would make relevant if you did it that way. And then what you could do is have about 10 of these games just keep them around 10 and 11 or 10, 10, 12 of these games uh, for teams that have had, I would even say this mid, mid, you know, the mid uh, group of five teams or other teams that have had seven wins or more enough with the six win stuff. Right. Cause then you'd have 14, say then you, then you'd have 24 games. That's 48 teams that are making the postseason. That's more than enough. Uh, but this is this model they have right now is just not just stupid. It's not sustainable. I mean, if you're on the sponsors of the Orange Bowl, what do you think right now when you see that 40, uh, the 40 to 42 guys? The, I mean, I, I saw another guy opted out today for, I think, Florida State. 40 to 42 guys from the two teams have decided that they're either going to transfer or go to the NFL, or uh, one, one guy saw opted to have a surgery he could have waited to have. You know what I mean? point I'm trying to make is what is the point of it? And so you hope that the playoff will solve that. Um, and if, and if the playoff solves that a little bit, I guess it'll be okay, but I'm all for protecting yourself. I'm all for, Hey, I'm going to the NFL. I'm all for that stuff. But by the same token, you know, over the course of 40 years of watching college football, I can probably count on less than one hand, the number of guys who, ruined their careers because they got really they got hurt in a in, in in a bowl game that's you know that's the flip side of it you know everyone points to this kid from michigan was it michigan i think the kid from michigan that got hurt a couple years ago or whatever yeah and then there was that old miss quarterback i think didn't get hurt in the sugar bowl or something yeah but i think he's still he's in the nfl he wasn't going to be a first oh he wasn't going to be a first round pick anyway um i'm talking about you know the kid from michigan they, everyone points to Willis McGahee, which, by the way, that was a, a championship game that he got hurt in. But Willis McGahee still, I, I looked it up, I think he made, what, like $40 million playing the NFL. He did okay. So my point is, this kid that the, actually the kid that the Steelers just signed, the linebacker from Notre Dame, he was a guy that actually got hurt. You know, but there's just so few of them. It's It's just one of those things where there's so few of these guys I don't know that necessarily it really needs to be a thing like it is. Well, and you know what, Paul, if I was the Orange Bowl, and this is this is the one thing I'll say, the Orange Bowl could have incentivized some of these people with some NIL deals. And these bowls haven't done that, so they get what they deserve, in my opinion, because, you know, how much money they have flown around those bowl games, and, and they don't want to share any of it with the players. To incent so, like, you know, in, in that respect – I think I think that's what you know the Orange Bowl deserves for for not trying in the age of NIL. You can make sure some of the maybe not all of them, maybe not the the biggest names who really yeah. have you know possible, but but some of those guys who got borderline decisions, you could probably sweet talk them into it if you wanted to. I don't think the Orange Bowl wants to, so I think they're they're getting what they deserve. And I'm excited for next season. I'm excited for things to change, open things up a little bit, and, and see what happens. So, uh, Paul, any final thoughts on on 2023? Now that we're uh, we're done here, no. Nope. Nope, not at all. I mean, it's been a long year. I guess next week we're going to be talking about 2024 and looking ahead and previewing 2024. 
Yes, and we'll have a real good read on what that means for the Steelers. You know, whether they win or lose this week, we're I think we're going to kind of know either way. Um, you know what the situation is. So I'm looking forward to breaking that down with you, Paul, and and hope you have a happy New Year and enjoy all the uh, the football we get to watch this weekend. All right, my man, sounds good. We'll do it again next week. Take care, everybody. All right, we'll see. You. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>